Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. It's very good to have you here. You, and the, the good news is we do not have to go back to Wycliffe for coffee. <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, coffee will be served in the monsoon room, which is immediately opposite there, uh, which Stephanie's already labelled the monsoon room, <laughs> which, which, which seems appropriate in the circumstances. Uh, particularly warm welcome to uh, Professor Tom Wright, who's uh, our lecturer for today and tomorrow. Um, Tom and I go back uh, a very long way. Um, and uh, as you will know, he's the writer of many and voluminous books. Uh, exhibit A, uh, here's, here's one here. One. I have um, some friends who, uh, she had a very, very difficult pregnancy and had to be in bed for most of the nine months of the pregnancy. Uh, and during that time, because of the amount of time she spent in it, the bed broke. <laughs> Uh, and th it, they had to prop up the leg of the bed <laughs> uh, for her to lie on it for the rest of the nine months. Uh, they used Jesus and the victory <laughs> of the God <laughs> um, to do that. And, and they asked me to tell Tom that they'd found his book very supportive <laughs> <laughs> at a difficult time. Uh, his books are indeed uh, supportive in all sorts of ways. And he's going to be speaking to us for the next two days on the victory of the cross. <laughs> so over to you, Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I knew Michael would have something funny to say about me. I wasn't sure which of his voluminous supply of jokes um, <laughs> he would actually bring out on this occasion. I, I've actually heard three different va variations of that one. but uh, <laughs> it's, like, it's like the synoptic problem. Yeah, like the synoptic problem. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And they may or may not any of them be historical. Never mind. Um, <laughs> Join me, will you, in a moment of prayer as we begin this particular series. Gracious Father, it's good to be together, and we thank you for bringing us here through long journeys and short, through all sorts of difficulties, no doubt, and we pray that you'll enable us in the course of these, this week to leave behind us just for the moment the things which press heavily upon our minds and hearts in order to focus upon the one thing that is needful and we pray for wisdom and skill again in handling scripture and handling some of the great truths of our faith that we may all of us glimpse afresh the full depth and power and majesty that was unveiled on the cross. So be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the things one normally does when one is given a microphone to wear and told to put it on is to switch off one's mobile phone, because otherwise the mobile phone interferes with the system, as you probably know. The reason I hadn't done that until now, and I'm about to do it when I've read you this, is that this morning, when I woke up, uh, as I usually do, wearily I check the email to see what's come in, and here is a message overnight from somebody who I don't know, who says, I'm attending a church that doesn't believe in penal substitution at all because it suggests that God dealt with violence with the use of violence, I, which I totally understand. I originally come from a such and such church, so I have a reformed background. I understand that churches can overemphasize penal substitution, but in my understanding of scripture, penal substitution is still necessary to a correct understanding of the gospel. Is this something I should be concerned with? People write me like this all the time, sadly. Um, <laughs> Should I attend a church that doesn't believe in God's just demands for sin that is met in the sacrifice of Jesus at the cross? On the other hand, this church has an amazing, amazing push for social justice, environmental protection, loving our enemy, etc., and I want to stay around to learn from them how they genuinely follow Jesus. Thank you for reading. And I thought, well, there we are. It's my text for the week. Um, <laughs> not quite, but one element of it. Let me quickly switch this off, lest worse occur. And I get more angry messages from people saying, how can you possibly say dot, 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 which I also do get sometimes. Um, because I wanted in this first lecture to sketch a little bit for you uh, something of why I think some sort of reappraisal of what we say about the cross is necessary for probably for most of us most of the time, certainly for some of us some of the time, certainly for me. I've written about many other aspects of the Christian faith over the last, ooh, I don't know, 
35, 40 years. By the way, I, it, was, it was very moving for me to be in Wycliffe Chapel this morning because I was a student at Wycliffe Hall from 1971 to 1973, so I sat in those pews and looked at those stained glass windows, and I've maybe been back two or three times since actually into that chapel, so it's, oh my goodness, this is like walking back into the house in which you were born, and it was, it was moving, and uh, I don't think I ever heard as many jokes in the course of my two years as we had in <laughs> ten, ten minutes this morning, but there we are. Somehow Wicklow wasn't so funny in those days. Um, but uh, I have been puzzling about this precisely because of the sorts of issues that this, uh, to me until today, unknown correspondent raises. That there are many different ways in to glimpsing the cross and actually, the New Testament offers many different ways in to glimpsing what's going on on the cross. And different churches have seized upon different ones and have said, this is what we have to say. And then sometimes, as one church has got more and more strong down one line, others have said, wait a minute, we're not so happy about that. You seem to be missing something out, or you're not doing it right, or whatever. And one of the puzzles that I had when I was Bishop of Durham was that there were churches in my diocese which were like the two that this person describes that on the one hand there were some who were saying the thing that we've got to do is to tell people that Jesus died in their place on their behalf he suffered for their sins and they need to believe that so that they will then be saved and will go to heaven and there were other churches that were saying wait a minute we're reading Matthew Mark Luke and John and we're seeing Jesus doing all kinds of neat things and healing people and feeding the hungry and looking after those who are uh, lost off at the margins and so on and that's the Jesus we follow that's what we want to be doing and then with that theology you sometimes have a sort of puzzled like a sort of balloon saying thinks dot 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 what a pity he died so young yeah, in other words we want to follow him doing all that what was his death about? And we don't want to emphasise it because that implies that we don't really care about those issues about feeding the hungry and housing the homeless and, and all, those, all those wonderful things. And it's almost as though you could divide churches into Gospels Christians and Epistles Christians. It doesn't, of course, come apart so cleanly, but sometimes that's how it seems when you talk to people about what their church is there for. Some people will emphasise, we are following Jesus in living the kingdom, bringing the good news of the kingdom to places and people that really badly need it. And there are others who say, well, the main thing is the kingdom in heaven and how we get there, and so Jesus died for our sins so that that's how, we could, how, how it could be. And there are two other problems which kind of fan out from that. And one is the one that I think of as, because I wrote the book with this title, called The Surprised by Hope Problem. That Some of you will know my book, Surprised by Hope, and actually I get more emails and letters about that book than all my others put together. Whether it's ever been used as a bedstand, I'm not sure, but it's used for, <laughs> used for many things. Um, and the thing that really grabbed me, ten or a dozen years ago when I was doing the work that led up to my big book on the resurrection and then to Surprised by Hope as a spin-off, is that so much of the Western church over the last thousand years has been dominated by the image of heaven and hell that you have, for instance, in Michelangelo's famous Sistine Chapel wall. I have this extraordinary memory of, uh, this may sound pretentious, the last time I was in the Sistine Chapel, um, uh, it was a big ecumenical service. I was an Anglican observer at a big meeting, and, and so I was sitting on this sort of observer's bench, and next to me was a, a Greek Orthodox Archimandrite from Athens. And as we were sitting waiting for the, the, the event to begin, uh, he looked at the two side walls of the Sistine Chapel, one of which is pictures of Moses, the other of which is pictures of Jesus. And he said, these I understand, and these I understand. And then he pointed at this great last judgment scene with some souls going to hell and others being to... He said, this I do not understand. That is not how we do eschatology in Greece. At which point, the procession came in with the Pope and the Cardinals and the ecumenical patriarch too. It was quite a service. And I never got to ask my Greek friend, so how do you do eschatology in Greece if you don't do it like that? But I think I know part of the answer that... The Greek Orthodox and many of the Orthodox churches emphasize resurrection and new creation, the whole world being renewed. That doesn't mean they're universalists, how they then do final judgment for those who finally say no. Some may be, but some, some aren't. But they don't do it like that. It's more like what C.S. Lewis does in his book, The Great Divorce, where the whole new world is this wonderful, glorious, glorious, 
more than real life, as it were, new creation, where everything is more real than it is in this present transitory world. And hell, if it's there at all, is a tiny, thin, insubstantial little place down a crack in the floor, so slight and irrelevant that it can't blackmail the glorious new creation into saying, because we're here, you can't have this new world. And Lewis is wrestling with that. I think he wrestled with that all his Christian life, actually. But for me, the New Testament is all about new creation. And the new creation which began when Jesus of Nazareth came out of the tomb on Easter morning. And it isn't basically about, quote, going to heaven when you die, unquote. I say that almost in a whisper, half expecting some of you to get up and walk out of the room and say, I thought I was coming to a Christian conference or whatever. Um, <laughs> The New Testament has remarkably little to say about what happens to people immediately after their death. Okay, today you will be with me in paradise, Luke 23. I'm going to prepare a place for you, John 14. And one or two other passages, Paul saying in Philippians 1, my desire is to depart and be with the Messiah, which is far better. But the great emphasis is not on what happens immediately after death, but on what happens ultimately, which is new creation, Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation 20, 20 uh, Revelation 21, 22. A new heavens and a new earth joined together forever. Ephesians 1, 10. God's plan from the beginning was to sum up in the Messiah everything in heaven and on earth. My friends, this is temple theology. The temple is the place where heaven and earth come together. Ephesians is the book which says... God has created a new temple, and it's called Jesus the Messiah, and then by the Spirit it's called all those who belong to Jesus. We are to be heaven and earth people already, here and now. It's tense, it's difficult, it's dangerous, but we are to anticipate thereby the time when heaven and earth will be together forever. As I was falling asleep from my long journey yesterday, I was thinking for some reason of that glorious old hymn, This Is My Father's World. Do you know that hymn? We, uh, I lived in Canada for a while and they sing it a lot there. For some reason it's not known in this country as far as, far as I'm aware. The, the, the third verse, which is sometimes uh, mutilated by people who don't like some of the victorious language, but it, the third verse goes like this. Um, this is my father's world, oh let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world, the battle is not done, Jesus who died will be satisfied and earth and heaven be won. That's the vision. It's not a, the first two verses could be a sort of sentimental uh, look at the trees and flowers and isn't this a nice place sort of thing. But the third verse is brutally realist. Yes, this is a wonderful world, but there is evil and so suffering and sorrow and decay and death in it. But Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. That's the vision of eschatology which we have in the New Testament. That's the goal. But if that is so then all our theories of the cross, which are so often designed in the Western world just to make sure we go to heaven, have to be rethought. Because if the goal is this entire new creation, and if somehow the cross is instrumental in that, then the meaning of the cross is not less than we thought, but it's a lot more. How do we put that together? Do we have to put it together? I mean, after all, uh, you don't have to know the theory of cooking in order to enjoy a good meal. I am one of the world's worst cooks. I grew up at a time when the women did the cooking and the men did the washing up afterwards. And that's still more or less how it is in our family. So that if my wife is tired and fed up and has cooked quite enough meals this week, thank you very much, then we have poached eggs, which I can do. Um, <laughs> but you don't have to know the theory of cooking in order to enjoy a good meal. But unless somebody in the household knows how to cook, then you're going to have a lot of indigestion or a lot of ham sandwiches, or possibly both. So that you don't have to know all the details of atonement theology in order to be overwhelmed with the love of God in Christ. That's how I came in. I was a little boy, age maybe seven, I don't know exactly when. And I just have this very clear memory of one day when I was about that age, suddenly being overwhelmed with the sense of God loving me so much that Jesus died for me. I have no idea what hymn we'd sung or what verse I'd heard read in church or whatever. It just suddenly hit me and that memory has never left me and the present sense of that has never left me. But the, so the cross has a power independent of theory, but 
in the church, people have to know the theory, otherwise you'll get the spiritual equivalent of either indigestion or ham sandwiches, or possibly both. You can see this power in so many things that happen, which some of the stories we know, some, we, some are new to us perhaps. In the year 2000, the so-called millennium, though that was a bit dodgy in itself, um, <laughs> the National Gallery in London, under the directorship of Neil McGregor, who then went on to work at the British Museum for 15 years and has now moved on from there, he, Neil is a practicing Christian, and he said for the millennium we're going to have an exhibition, Seeing Salvation. And the whole National Gallery was turned into this great, basically Christian exhibition. And most of the paintings and artifacts for this Seeing Salvation exhibition were, of course, about the crucifixion. And the critics in the sneery British national press, you who don't live in Britain, you may not know, our press, whichever personality type it was that Michael mentioned before, <laughs> our press is very, very good at sneering doesn't celebrate things, it uh, sneers. They say, why do we need to see all these horrible pictures of somebody being tortured to death 2,000 years ago? How can that possibly be a message of hope? for The general public, I'm happy to say, ignored the media and came in droves. People went twice, they went five times. They kept on, because there was something in those pictures which just says, yes, something bigger than theory is there and people just needed to be bathed in that something. And then a much more sharp-edged and, and sad image at the moment. Some of you will know one, the, the last artefact that Neil McGregor bought for the British Museum before he left to, went to his new job, which is actually in Germany, was a Lampedusa cross. Lampedusa is a little island near Sicily in the Mediterranean. And there were some migrants coming from Eritrea and elsewhere, desperate to get to Europe. People smugglers using uh, grubby little boats, and the boat smashed, and hundreds were drowned. And uh, an artisan, a, a man who worked on the island of Lampedusa, desperately trying to save people, and then took some of the wood from that smashed boat and made it into a cross. And then other people said, w will, you, will you do another one and another one? And the Pope carried one of those Lampedusa crosses when he went to have a service in commemoration of those victims. And Neil McGregor asked that same craftsman if he would make a Lampedusa cross so that he could put it in the British Museum as a sign that the suffering of God in Christ on the cross somehow is the only message, the only image that will do to hold the pain of the present world before the love and hope of God. You don't, again, you don't need a theory for that. For some mm. reason, for some reason, it just works as a focus to hold together the pain of the world and the love of God. And then my, my, third, my third example, which I wish I knew, if, if any of you know the story better than I do and know the name of the person in question, then do tell me afterwards. But the story is told, this is preacher's trick, the story is told, um, of uh, a Roman Catholic archbishop who described three young teenage lads for a laugh going into church and pretending to confess to all sorts, going in, in one by one into the confessional and confessing to all sorts of lurid, horrible sins. And the first two, having done this, uh, had a laugh and ran away sniggering. And the priest got the third lad after he'd done his turn. And he didn't let him go. He said, I'm going to set you a penance for these sins that you've, uh, that you've confessed. He said, I want you to go up to the other end of the church where there's a big image of Christ on the cross. He said, I want you to look at the face of that figure, and I want you to say, you did all that for me, and I don't give that much. And I want you to do it three times. And he said, the young boy went up, you did all that for me, and I don't. And then he did it the second. And then he couldn't do it the third time. He welled up. And the archbishop said, the reason I know that story is that I was that young man. The theory isn't necessary. What is necessary is this encounter, this sense of something much bigger than theory, much bigger than ourselves, much bigger than anything we can imagine. So there's a puzzle. How on earth? And we, we meet this all the time with skeptics, sneerers, or just puzzled inquirers, how can the death of one man 2,000 years ago mean any such thing 
And so people go to the New Testament and say, well, Christ died for our sins. Fine. Okay, what, what does that mean? Died for our sins. How do we put that together? And when we say that, there's an apparently bewildering range of ideas. The New Testament talks about sacrifice. It talks about redemption, which is a metaphor from the slave market. It talks about justification, which is a metaphor from the law court. Do these all belong together? Are they simply different random ways of trying to get our fingers on something that's going on? And so, back to my correspondent. So many churches either say, we have this theory, this is what you have to believe, and this is the only safe way to preach the gospel. Or they say, no, that's a violent image. We don't do violence today. Once you start talking about God doing violence, then you unleash all kinds of demons which have poisoned our world and continue to do so. What matters is God's love and God's love for the outcast, and we have to embody that, and so on and so on and so on. And then we notice that the New Testament says the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Paul summarizes the basic gospel. The Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. What does it mean, in accordance with the Scriptures? And in this Bible and many others, there are little notes in the side of other Bible passages that you might like to look up which might be relevant. And this will give, I didn't check this before, but I, I can pretty well guarantee, this will give at that point two or three nice references. Yes, here we are, Isaiah 53, um, uh, Hosea 6.2, Jonah 2.1, as it's raised on the third day. But the only reference it gives for according to the scriptures is Isaiah 53. Now, Isaiah 53, yes, that's a very important passage. But the point about saying according to the scriptures isn't I can find a couple of proof texts for this. It's there's an entire narrative, there's an entire story running through from Genesis to Chronicles in the Hebrew Bible or from Genesis to Malachi in the way we order the Bibles, the Old Testament in, in English translations. And it's that entire narrative which makes the sense it makes. And here's the puzzle then. There's almost nothing in that entire narrative about going to heaven when you die. That's not what first century Jews are interested in. For me, one of the great aha moments when I was doing my initial research on the New Testament in the late 70s, around the time Michael and I first met, was reading Josephus, the Jewish historian. And Josephus describes in great detail what's going on in Jerusalem in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And it's horrendous stuff and it ends horribly. I mean, it's a very, very unpleasant ending to the Roman-Jewish War, 68, 9, 70, when Jerusalem gets destroyed. But Josephus is describing what people are debating and discussing and where the pressure points are and how they are retrieving their scriptures in order to fuel what they're thinking. And it's not discussing about what you have to believe in order to go to heaven. They, if they're devout Jews of whatever sort, they know that God will look after them, that God will bring his new age, God will do the new thing sooner or later. The question is, when will he do it, how will he do it, what sort of people do we have to be in the present time to be part of that great plan for God's great renewal? They talk about the present age and the age to come. The rabbis go on talking about it later. And the age to come will not be sitting on clouds up in the sky somewhere. The age to come will be like C.S. Lewis's vision, like this one, only gloriously more so, a world full of justice and peace. Isaiah 11, Habakkuk 2, many other passages. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I've said it a thousand times. How do the waters cover the sea? The waters are the sea. Somehow God intends to suffuse the whole creation with his love. And Israel in the first century was clinging on to that as things got worse, as pagan armies and empires had closed in on them. And the question comes, was that missing the point? And have we in the Western Christian world, got hold of the right point, namely that the aim actually is to leave this world and go to heaven when we die? And if so, how does the cross enable that? Or is it the Western church since the Middle Ages that's got it wrong? And do we have to revise our view in the light of the New Testament? New creation, new heavens, new earth. How does the cross address that? Because, let's not make any mistake about this, in the New Testament, again and again, people make it clear. By 6 p.m. on the first Good Friday, the world was a different place. Nobody knew. 
Maybe the centurion at the foot of the cross glimpsed something of that. You know, truly this man was the son of God. Who knows what he had in mind? Who knows what Mark wants us to think he had in mind, etc., etc. But Jesus on the cross says, according to John, it's finished, it's done, it's accomplished. The work is complete. Paul in Colossians 2 says on the cross he disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, triumphing over them. What? It looked as though the principalities and powers were celebrating a triumph over him. What was that about? The Gospels are all very clear. Something happened on the cross as a result of which. It isn't just a new possibility opened up so that now there's an option that people can take up if they want. It's that the world is a different place. And if it doesn't look like that, we need to adjust our spectacles. And so the question presses, why did Jesus die? What do we say about it? I once, believe it or not, taught Sunday school. When we were in Montreal, my wife was teaching the grade six Sunday school. Somebody wanted her to move to the grade four because that teacher had dropped out. And she said to me, would you like to do the grade six? And I said, I've never taught anything under the age of 17 before. Um, how do I? And she said, here's the syllabus. And I looked at it. And it was pretty much what I was teaching my first year undergraduate. So I thought, OK, I'll do that. Um, <laughs> Um, and we went, part of the syllabus that year was to go through the Gospels and for them to get their hands dirty a bit with some of the texts and some of the issues. And towards the end, when we were getting towards the, getting towards the cross, I, I, it was a class of about maybe 15 kids, um, bright, and I, I said, OK, I want you each to write down on a piece of paper, why did Jesus die? What's your answer to that? Why did Jesus die? And it was roughly split 50-50. And it wasn't a male-female thing or anything like that. But when they read out their answers, about half of them gave me the historical reasons. He died because the Romans were worried he was leading a revolution. He died because the chief priest didn't like what he did in the temple, whatever. And the other half gave me the, the theological solutions. He died so that we could go to heaven. He died because of our sins. He died to save us. And we spent a very interesting hour putting those two sets of answers together. Because here's the puzzle and we'll meet this again in the second lecture this morning, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, do not seem to give us very much in the way of what we have traditionally thought of as atonement theology. The Gospels don't seem to be saying, by the way, here's the theory. They tell us the story, the story which Michael plugged us into, which begins Matthew 26 and onwards. Uh, it begins with the plot and Judas and with... Uh, the woman in the house of Simon the leper, and then move swiftly on through the events of the upper room and the Last Supper, and through the events of the arrest in Gethsemane and the trials, or whatever they are, and then the scourging and the, and the torture, and so on. In all of that, is there an atonement theology? Some people have said, well, basically no. And what you have to do is to find the odd verse here and there, like John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his son. Fine, okay. Mark 10, 45, okay. The Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. Right, those are signs and clues. But is that it? Is this, as it were, a historian's, a bird's eye, what you'd have seen as a fly on the wall sort of account, over which we then have a bit of theory in the form of a couple of verses? But in order to get a proper atonement theology, you have to go all the way to Paul and to Hebrews. Is that how it is? good friend of mine described the puzzle as he said a lot of Christians regard the Gospels as the sort of optional chips and dips that you have at the beginning of a, a nice evening before you then go to the table where you get the red meat of Pauline theology. <laughs> Recognise? You know, that, that we can so easily use the Gospels as illustrations of lots of other things rather than as actually telling the story of how and why all this happened, because maybe we've been looking for the wrong thing. Jesus himself doesn't seem to say very much about the meaning of his death. He does a little bit. He does talk a lot about the kingdom of God. And here's, this is back to that problem of the two churches, if you like. You have kingdom churches and you have cross churches. Cross churches emphasize Jesus died for our sins and will preach on that, whether it's Christmas or Epiphany or Lent or Easter or Ascension. Or, it's always about Jesus dying for our sins. Now, great, people need to know that. But what about the kingdom of God? What does that mean? And if 
you read Matthew's Gospel and read Kingdom of Heaven, don't be misled. In Matthew's Gospel, Kingdom of Heaven is a reverent Jewish way of saying Kingdom of God, and the Kingdom of Heaven is not a place called Heaven where people go when they die. It is the rule of Heaven on Earth. That's what Jesus taught us to pray. We prayed it an hour, an hour ago together. Thy Kingdom come on Earth as in Heaven. Jesus says at the end of Matthew 28, all authority in Heaven and on Earth has been given to me. I've often said, especially when I was preaching in Durham and elsewhere, we in the Western Church are quite good at imagining Jesus having all authority in heaven. We kind of like that idea. And we'll go there and share it with him, whatever that means. No. He says, and on earth. We've hardly begun to imagine what it might mean that Jesus has all authority on earth. In fact, we've often said, no, we don't want to go there. That's a dilution of the gospel. We're not interested in earth. We have to leave earth and go to heaven. Welcome to the world of Platonism. I read a critique recently of something that I'd written in which somebody about the notion of exile, and somebody, this, this critic, had said, well, exile is all right as an idea because basically we as humans are exiled from our true home in heaven. And I went back and looked at the texts and I thought, no, the person who articulates that idea most clearly is Plutarch at the end of the first century. He's a middle Platonist. He's not a Christian. The New Testament doesn't say we humans are exiled from our home in heaven. Paul says at the end of Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await the Lord, the Saviour Jesus, who will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body. What does it mean our citizenship is in heaven? Many people in Philippi were citizens of Rome. They did not expect one day to retire and go back to Rome. That wasn't the point. Rome was already overfull and underfed and desperately didn't want all those wretched co colonials coming back again. No, thank you. The point of being a Roman citizen in Philippi is that you are to be an agent of Roman civilization in northern Greece. Paul doesn't say we are citizens of heaven, so we'll go back there one day. Thousands of preachers have preached that from that text. That's not what the text says. He says, from it we await the Saviour. And the doctrine of the second coming in the New Testament is not, as I'm sure you know, about Jesus coming back, hovering in midair, and then taking people away again. There's many who believe that. It's about Jesus coming back to transform and rule and reign so that earth and heaven may be one. So the theories which have developed, there is no early doctrine, there is no, early, there is no one single early doctrine of the cross. The early fathers use all sorts of ideas and images to try to get at this extraordinary dark mystery of the meaning of the cross. A lot of them stress what I just said before, that on, from Colossians 2, that on the cross Jesus won the victory over all the dark forces of the world. And we, we need to have some sort of understanding of the dark forces, whether sitting on letterboxes or not, in order to understand what was going on when Jesus died. But then many have played off against that, one way or another, the idea that somehow he was our substitute, he stood in for us, he took our punishment. And different theories of representation and how that might work have come and gone. But those are obviously the two big theories which today, as any day, one still finds put into an either-or scheme. That's either a victory, Christus victor, Jesus, that, my, that book of mine which Michael waved around, Jesus and the victory of God. Um, people have said, oh, I suppose that means you take a Christus victor theory of the atonement. Well, yes, I do, but not to the exclusion of substitution. Rather, what I see in the New Testament is a fusion of the two, but we'll come to that. But then what about sacrifice? Here's another great puzzle. I, I, I have never killed an animal with my bare hands, and I suspect that probably 90% of you, the same would be true. So most of us are completely detached from even the sheer physicality of what it was like day by day, week by week, month by month, when people in Jerusalem and in the pagan temples around the world brought animals for sacrifice and somebody killed them and did stuff and so on. But for many years, people, because we've been detached from the, actu the actuality of sacrifice, we have allowed our imaginations, our theological imaginations, to project onto sacrifice and sacrificial terms. All sorts of ideas which actually don't belong there. Because when you look at Leviticus, when you look at the way in which the sacrifices are spoken of in later Jewish texts, and the way that the rabbis refer back to them, even though the temple had then been destroyed, they are not talking about people who deserve death 
somehow trans transferring their guilt and then thence their punishment onto the animal that is sacrificed. For one thing, the animal is not killed on the altar in ancient Hebrew sacrifices. Some, many, many pagan sacrifices, yes, the animal is killed on the altar. Uh, but in Israel, the animal is killed elsewhere and it's the blood, the sign of life, which is presented on the altar. For another thing, the one moment in the Hebrew calendar when sins are confessed over an animal, that is precisely the one animal that is not sacrificed. That's the scapegoat that is driven out into the wilderness. I know there's a lot of debate about this, but it is at least more complicated than we have imagined. You can't simply say, ah yes, here we have sacrificial language in the New Testament, and we know that's basically about the animal substituting for the worshipper. There is, in some cases, a sense of substitution, but it is much more complicated than that, and you can't simply transfer the one to the other. Rather, we need to remind ourselves that sacrifices take place because at the end of the book of Exodus, they have constructed the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is the place where the sacred presence of God, the divine glory, has come to dwell along with the people in the wilderness, despite their sin with the golden calf. The tabernacle is the place where somehow heaven and earth have come together. There is a sort of narrative arc, I'll come back to this in a minute, from Genesis 1 and 2 to Exodus 40. Have you ever read the Pentateuch like this? Genesis 1 and 2 is the creation of a, a heaven and earth reality, which is a temple. John Walton in Wheaton College is very good writing about this at the moment. Uh, and that heaven and earth reality is then fractured with human rebellion and sin and idolatry and empire, empire in, in uh, Genesis 11. And God starts his renewal project with Abraham and there is a sense already with Abraham that maybe God's presence will somehow graciously come back and be with his people. We don't quite know how. And then it, the story goes on until after the Exodus. Remember what Moses says to Pharaoh again and again is not let my, let my people go so that they may go to their promised land. Let my people go so that they may worship me. And they can't worship Israel's God in a land dominated by Egypt's gods. They have to go out into virgin territory, as it were, and there God establishes the covenant and they build the tabernacle, which is a microcosmos, a little world. If you read Josephus's description of the tabernacle and the temple, it's like a little mini creation, a little garden of Eden, a place where God and his people can be together again. And that's a dangerous place to be if you're a sinful and rebellious and hard-hearted people, which the Pentateuch makes it clear they still were. And so the only way this can happen is if they are purified, if the furniture is purified, if everything to do with the thing is purified. And because impurity is basically about death, is basically about corruption and decay, everything that denies the goodness of God's creation, the lifeblood of the animal is the thing given by God to purify so that in fact God may dwell with his people. That's where it's all going. So we have the victory over evil, we have substitution or some form of it, we have sacrificial ideas but it's not as easy as we usually think to put them together. And of course we have the theory that Jesus died as an example. I remember John A.T. Robinson who wrote that book, um, uh, oh, mind goes totally blank, Honest to God, thank you, 1963. Um, he wrote a, a subsequent book called But That I Can't Believe, and one of the things he said he couldn't believe was any idea that Jesus somehow took our punishment on the cross or anything like that. And his chapter on the cross was called, was a title from a, a pop song of the time, which was That's What Love Will Do. That's What Love Will Do. In other words, an exemplary reading of the cross. The idea that on the cross Jesus showed us Greater love has no one than this to lay down your life for your friends. And Jesus did it. That's the example. And, and that, but you know, that, that's true. First John says, if God loved us that much, we ought to love one another. Absolutely. It's again and again in the New Testament. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in the Messiah forgave you. Yes, it is an example. But it only works as an example if something else is also the case. If I see... Uh, a close and dear friend, let's just say Michael for example, um, falling into a river and I jump in risking life and limb to save him. That's a wonderful act of love. Yes, because he needed saving. 
So it becomes an act of love. But, but if Michael and I are just walking along the towpath, and in order to show him how much I love him, I dive into the river, uh, no, that doesn't mean anything at all. It's not an act of love unless it's doing something that needed doing. So the theory of the example by itself really won't work. The problem, I think, for many of us today is that we are the heirs to uh, the 16th and 17th century. And in the 16th century, I'm not a uh, 16th, 17th century scholar, but I've studied bits and pieces here and there. There were two things which really weighed heavily on the reformers' hearts that they had to get rid of. One was purgatory. It's hard for us now to imagine just how much purgatory was dominating the horizon, the mental and emotional imaginative horizon of people in the 16th century uh, from the medi medieval period. Everyone knew, they thought they knew, that when you died, you would go into a terrible place called purgatory and you'd stay there for a long, long, long time until your sins had finally been purged, until you'd finally been punished sufficiently for them. Purgation and punishment. And only the very, very sacred few, the real utter saints, would escape that and would go straight to heaven. So it's a, it's a scheme you get in Dante, of course. You, 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 people go to the inferno, the people go to hell, that's just there. But anyone who's going to heaven, except a very small select few, will have to do time in purgatory first. And the reformers said no. And they said no on the basis of scripture, and thank God that they did. But they were giving scriptural answers to medieval questions. That's the problem. And the, the argument they made was, our sins have already been punished in Christ, and therefore God will never demand punishment for them again. And, they said, in baptism, faith, and then in death itself, any purgation that is required is achieved, so that that won't be required of us either. And so I, I've expounded this many times. It's there in, in several of my books. But if you read Romans 8, nothing in all creation will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and, and if you insist on saying, no, 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 I'll still have to do time in purgatory first, then actually what you need is not a theologian, but a psychiatrist. <laughs> because you know, why are you clinging to this when God has done it on the cross? So yeah, that, that is hugely important. And so they emphasized those aspects of the death of Jesus, which would help them deal with it. The other thing was the mass. The idea that in every Eucharist mass, call it what you will, the priest was re-sacrificing Christ. And the reformers, partly because they saw all the abuses to which this led, and there were many, they said, no, 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 no. They went back to Romans 6 and said, F hapax, once and only once, once for all. Jesus died once, he does not die again. And what they were doing was emphasizing the question that I raised 10 minutes, quarter of an hour ago. Something had happened by 6 p.m. on the first Good Friday, which does not need to be done again. Yes, absolutely vital. All our Eucharistic theology has to start at that point. But those key questions of the time, it seems to me, over-conditioned the way that they read the scriptures. And in particular, they never grasped. Interesting, Karl Barth makes this point about Luther and Calvin. And Karl's a, Karl Barth's a great Luther and Calvin fan and scholar. But he says they never really sorted out their eschatology. They never really figured out the stuff in the New Testament about new heavens and new earth. So that to this day, people in those traditions still think of salvation in terms of leaving this place and going to a place called heaven, which is not what the New Testament says. And so, as a result, different theories have developed. And I've been in correspondence with various people about this recently, but I'm interested particularly in what people hear when they hear the cross explained in sermons and so on in church. And again and again, what people hear, and it's sometimes because people say it, and it's other times because despite the fact that the preachers and theologians do their best not to say this, this is still what is heard. What is heard is that at the beginning, God set up the human race with a moral challenge, a test, an exam. Here's a high bar that you've got to jump over. And it comes in the form of, you're going to live in this garden, but you're not to eat this from the fruit of this tree. And are they going to keep this moral challenge, or aren't they? And the answer is, of course, they don't. And so, what does that mean? So they're out of fellowship with God. Well, yes, 
Does it say that? Well, sort of, but that's not quite the point. But so that then they lack righteousness, they lack the moral. Where does this come from? The idea seems to be if they had jumped over this moral bar, they would have achieved a moral standing, call it righteousness if you like, which would then mean that God would say, okay, you're in, you're it, you're good. Is that actually how Genesis 1 to 3 works? I don't think so. And yet huge theories have been developed on this, sometimes called with the wonderful phrase, the covenant of works, that God establishes a covenant of works with Adam and Eve, they fail, the covenant of works is repeated on Sinai, the Jews fail, and then God comes in the person of Christ and he keeps the law perfectly. He does everything he ought, and so he has a store of righteousness which can then be imputed, reckoned, passed over, whatever, to those who belong to him, however you define that. Now, there are many different meanings to the phrase covenant of works. I'm not a 17th century specialist either, so I am not familiar with all the different wrinkles and turns and twists, and there may be some here who are. Please put me right afterwards. But what I'm talking about is the low-grade version of this that many people in many churches just think is the gospel, that God set us a moral test we all failed it, Jesus passed it, we cling onto his coattails, and somehow that's all right. And of course, this way of putting it, focused on the cross as Jesus taking our punishment, and then somehow supplying us with what we need to get into heaven in the end, this breeds the reaction which I read from my correspondent this morning. That many people in many churches look at that and say, that's not a good picture of God. What many people hear as the gospel is God was standing there with a big stick. Here's this moral challenge. You keep it or else, or else, and then at the last minute, somebody else stands in the way and takes the rap in our place. It happens to be God's own son. And the preacher says, there you are. That, that's how it worked. And many, many people in our world have reacted sharply against that. That is, of course, a caricature. And when I've said this sort of thing, I get two reactions. On the one hand, wise theologians and wise preachers say, I've never preached like that. I, know, I would never teach that. And I say, no, of, co of course you wouldn't. But then the other reaction is lots of people around the room nod. Yeah, this is what we've heard. This is where we know a lot of folk are. And it may be a misunderstanding, but this, this is a picture, a pagan picture of a bullying God. A God who demands blood and doesn't much mind whose it is. And a God who, while he's doing it, says, oh, by the way, I'm doing this because I love you. And there are many people in our world who've been abused physically, mentally, whatever, and often the abuser will turn around at the end of the day and say, you do realize I love you. And there are lots of people in our world who say, I know that person and I hate him. And that's why many react strongly against that and go back to the Gospels, and there they find Jesus, who is quite unlike that, who's having a party with sinners. So that's the Jesus I want to follow. And this is the, the trap into which I think a lot of late 20th, early, early 21st century Christianity has fallen. So how then do we tell the story? How do we tell the story of the hope of Israel? How do we tell the story in such a way that when we get to Luke 24, we understand what... Remember how Luke 24 works, the story of the two on the Emmaus Road. We had hoped that he was going to redeem Israel. Jesus doesn't say, what a silly idea, redeeming Israel, that's not the point. The point is to save you from your sins so you can go to heaven. No, Jesus says, it's happened, but not the way you thought. Because beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What does that story look like? What did Luke have in mind? What did Jesus have in mind? There's a whole lot of stuff I could drop in here just to, to contextualize it, but I'd skip it, you can read it, it's various places. Crucifixion, we need to remind ourselves. Um, many people wear crosses around their neck or earrings or whatever, I'm sure you all know this. The cross is an instrument of torture, not a piece of jewelry. The cross was not just an instrument of torture, it was a way of degrading people. It was a way of not only killing them, but sneering at them, rubbing them out. You think you're someone, we're going to show you. Leaving them to rot. When Spartacus led the slave revolt about 100 years before Jesus' day, day, 
and they lost the last battle, 71 BC. The Romans killed a lot of them in the battle, but they crucified 6,000 of them and put them on crosses all along the road between Rome and Capua. That's about the distance from London to Birmingham or Philadelphia to Washington DC. Every 40 yards, roughly, another half-dead, half-alive corpse being crawled over by mice or flies or rats or whatever. And anyone walking down that road would think, I may not like being a slave, but I sure as anything don't want that. It was a way of humiliating people. Put them outside a city gate because everyone will see you when they go by. That's what they were doing with Jesus. The cross had a social meaning. It meant we are superior and you are inferior. It had a political meaning. It meant we have conquered your territory and we're keeping it that way. It had a <coughs> theological meaning in the Roman world. It meant Caesar is Lord and any of your local gods and goddesses are just worth that much. In the Jewish world, the Jews didn't use crucifixion except for one horrible exception in 88 BC, but the Jews knew perfectly well what crucifixion meant. Jesus grew up under the shadow of the cross. Around the time he was born, there was a rebellion and the Romans crucified thousands in Galilee. 40 years after his death, the Roman Jewish war, there were so many crosses around the walls of Jerusalem that they'd cut down all the trees and had to import timber from somewhere else. That's why the olive trees you see today in the Garden of Gethsemane are post AD 70 olive trees. Olive trees live forever unless you cut them down. So that the ones in Galilee we think are still the originals that the boy Jesus probably played under. The ones in Jerusalem all went. And nobody in that world would look at somebody hanging on a cross and say, and say he did that for me, or he's doing that for our sins. What does that mean? What does it mean to say that the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures? I've already hinted at the great biblical narrative of creation and new creation. You see it in these great arcs. You see it from Genesis 1 and 2 to Exodus 40, as I said. You see it from Genesis 1 and 2 to Deuteronomy 30 and Deuteronomy 32. Paul tells the story like that in Romans 9 and 10, a story that arcs across from Genesis to Deuteronomy. You see it then in the greater arc that lands you up in Isaiah. You see it in the greater arc that lands you up at the end of Chronicles or at the end of Malachi. A sense of a people called to be God's means of rescuing the world, the people of Israel, but who are themselves in need of rescue. I have explored in several of my books the way in which the biblical narrative works like a set of Russian dolls. Um, I was in debate with a fellow scholar last week who was kind of raising his eyebrows at that and saying, whoever thought anything so silly, but I stick to it. God called humans to be his means of making his world fruitful and flourishing. Adam and Eve were not called in order to have a moral test to see whether they could leave Eden and go to heaven instead. God said, get on with the job, be fruitful and multiply and look after my world. They're given a task, a garden. Adam names the animals. What's this about? It's about bearing the image of God. Hang on, Genesis 1 is a temple, I said. Heaven and earth coming together. What's the, if you're building a pagan temple, what's the last thing you put into the temple? The image, so that Worshippers can know who the God is and so that the power of the God is unleashed into the world around. Humans were put into God's world to be image bearers, angled mirrors to reflect the power and love and grace and wisdom of God into the world and reflect the worship and praise of the world back to God. Longest dark of all to the book of Revelation. By your blood you ransomed humans for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation to make them kings and priests to serve our God. Okay, kings and queens. Okay, sidebar. Every time I mention kings in the presence of Americans, they say, we got rid of kings 250 years ago. And, <laughs> and my response is always, yeah, you got rid of George III and you got George I instead, you know, because actually <laughs> your, your president is much more like an ancient monarch than anything, that we, et cetera. We, we, we don't need to go around those tracks, okay? We just sort of hold off on that one. So 
the idea of king, if you want to know what the biblical vision of monarchy is, read Psalm 72. Read Psalm 72. The king is the one who listens to the cry of the poor and needy and makes sure that they are looked after. The king is the one through whom God's delight in his world comes to birth again and again in his creation. Kings and priests. Kings, that is, the ones who share God's rule over the world. Priests, the ones who share the worship of creation and present it before God. That's what it means to be image bearers. And so the primal sin is not sin itself, but idolatry. Worshipping something other than God. In Romans 1, people say, well, Romans 1, 18 to 3.20, that's all about all humans of sin. Well, it sort of is, but it doesn't begin with that. It begins with asebia with ungodliness, and only ungodliness produces adikia, injustice, Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is revealed against idolatry because when you worship that which is not God, your humanness starts to deconstruct and you produce injustice in the world. And then all kinds of sin follows. It isn't that God creates a world and sets a high moral bar and says, if you can jump over this, you're in my special people and I'll take you off somewhere else. It's God wants his world to be fruitful, so he creates people in his image to do that job for him. Now, then, when that goes wrong, God calls Abraham. Abraham as he is, and Abraham as he gets renamed later on. And God makes promises to Abraham that correspond to the commands to Adam. In you and in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And here's grace for you. When God wants to start the family that will rescue the world, when God wants to set up a territory like a new Eden, he calls a childless nomad. Isn't that interesting? So that it must be all of grace. But he calls him knowing that Abraham, and and the, the narrators of Genesis know this perfectly well, Read the Pentateuch again and again. They rub your noses. And then the books of Samuel and Kings. They say this even about David and Solomon. Of course they do. That these people who are carrying the promise that God will rescue the world are themselves people in need of rescue. The prophets say it again and again. This is not, as people sometimes accuse me of saying, this is not a sort of Christian sneer at the Jews. Oh, we think the Jews are wrong. No, it's something that the prophets themselves say and that the New Testament grieves over. Paul grieves over it. The people who are bearing the promise themselves need that promise for themselves. And the result is exile. And the exile from the land, again and again and again we are told, is the result of idolatry and sin. Idolatry and sin, therefore you're exiled from the land which God promised your ancestors. And that exile corresponds exactly to Genesis 3. The exile of Adam and Eve from the God. And the narrators must know this. And here's the problem. When you worship that which is not God, you give to the idol you're worshipping, whatever it is, something of the power which you as a human being should have been exercising. The God-given image-bearing power to bring justice and healing and hope to God's world. You're handing that over to the powers, whatever we call them, however we characterize them. And those powers will use that power to warp your humanness and that of the world around you. It's how idolatry works. We are supposed to be creatures of God-given power and responsibility and authority. And that's a hard task. That's the real bar, if you like, to jump over. And we say, no, that's too hard. We will worship this idol. This will give me a nice time on this front. We will worship that god or goddess because they'll do something for me and then I won't have to bother. And the gods and the goddesses say, thank you very much. We will take that power, borrowed, usurped power, and we will use it. And so a world full of idols is what God then has to deal with. And that's what's happening at the time of the exile. And at the time of the exile, great prophets arise who say, God will overthrow the pagan idols and rescue his people and thereby rescue the whole world. That is the story the scriptures tell. And when the early Christians say the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that's 
what they think was going on, which is enough for the first hour. We will take some time for Q&A and we will then come back to the Gospels in the second hour. What I suggest we do, we're going to have some Q&A time before coffee. You have, I'm sure you're desperate for coffee and that'll be in 25 minutes' time. I'm going to suggest that you each turn to your neighbour and say for two minutes what you find found puzzling, worrying, heretical, exciting, dramatic, different, and then when you've said it to one another we can have some Q&A together. So, okay, have a buzz for two minutes with yourselves. <laughs> 